This is the Spa Retailer Podcast, where we talk retail, business, and all things related to the hot tip industry. I'm your host, Megan Kendrick, owner of Spa Retailer Magazine. Today on the Spa Retailer Podcast, I have Jay Breuer and Brandon Jones. They are the owners of St. Sears Pool and Spa, and they've got their original location in Middleton, Massachusetts, but they've also made a couple of acquisitions. They bought Budget Pools, which is nearby the St. Sears location, and then they just finished acquiring Swimming Pool Center up in New Hampshire. So thanks for coming on, guys. Thank you, Megan. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. I know a little bit about your story, but mostly just the headlines and not the nitty gritty. So I'm excited to talk to you and learn all of the all of the backstory to how we got into the place that we're at now. But we always start with talking to people about where you grew up, where you came from, how you ended up in in the hot tub industry. So let's let's go ahead and get started with you, Jay. Okay. How did you end up here? All right. I'll try to be brief. We'll see. So I actually started at St. Cyr um, when I was 16, basically right after I got my license. My brother was actually running the Middleton location at that oh, time. Okay. Okay. At the time we had the Middleton location and we had our original location in Salisbury. But to go back even further than that, how we really got in, both of us, is that Brandon and I are actually like third cousins. So it's a family business. I started in... 2001, I think, just opening pools, working in the store, sweeping floors, all that kind of fun stuff, and was there for about six years. And then me and my brother left to kind of go and, you know, with his business partner and open another store. So we left St. Cyr, and we were at this other uh, company for about 13 years. Uh, my brother then left the industry to pursue other things. And I was like, all right, time for me to do my own thing. So I called uh, Brandon's uncle, John St. Cyr, who owned the company at that point, and say, hey, you look going to retire? So I'm looking to do something. And he basically put Brandon and I together in 2019. And I came on, came back to St. Cyr in 2019 to partner up with Brandon. And we've been just cruising ever since. But yeah, so going on, I don't know, 22 years now, something like that. Seems yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Brandon, how did the store get started then? My grandparents started St. Cyr Pool and Spa in the 70s. Okay. And and my grandmother ran the store. My grandfather did the construction side of it. And I actually had nothing to do with it at all. And I didn't get into pools and hot tubs until about seven years ago. Okay. And yeah. And so how it happened is a little crazy, right? It was, I think 2015, we had all that snow in February where it was just storm after storm after storm. I don't know, some sort of little mental break <laughs> and decided I was going to move to Florida. Yeah, it was very rough. So I decided I was going to move to Florida and there were a lot of pool companies down there. And with my family's pool background, I felt like I could fall back on if I had any issues. So I picked a spot in Florida and found a company and got on a plane and moved. Didn't know anybody, didn't have a place to live. So I stayed in the warehouse for a while, but <laughs> I made it work. And after about two, three years down there, I really wanted to come back. And uh, and that's when I got in touch with my Uncle John and same time that, that Jay was getting in touch with them. And, and so it was like, it was a month to be, yeah. really. And Those uh, Florida summers, not quite all they, not quite all they cracked up I, to be <laughs> ready to get so, out of the heat. <laughs> I loved it, actually. I love the heat. Some of were oppressive, but it didn't bother me. Yeah. It was really, I had two girls and my wife and two girls were staying up here while I was getting things going down there, which made it even harder. Oh, yeah. So, but once it came time to to move it all south, they they just couldn't do it. They got their friends in school and everything, and it just wasn't going to work. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. that's a big ask for sure. It is. Um, it was a huge ask. And for them to say yes in the beginning was a lot. Yeah. So, yeah, did no the com so did the company get started as a pool builder then? Yes. Yeah, it was pool construction, and then the store opened shortly after. Yeah. Okay. And you're I think still it was 72 to 75 ish, somewhere in that realm. Okay. Yep. Do you know when hot tubs entered the mix? Ooh. So... I know that's not hard if you weren't the ones doing it, right? <laughs> yes. They purchased 
this, the Middleton location from Bicknell, Houston, which is the precursor to SCP back in the early 90s. Okay. And so it was a retail store even back then, going back who knows how long, and the distributor. And at that time, they were selling Baja spas. Oh, yeah, like, Baja out of Tucson, yeah. no longer in business. No longer. And I remember my brother telling me stories about how they had to plumb them before they went out and all that stuff. So they were uh, they were doing spas back then in the early 90s and then they picked up dimension 1 in 1998 i want to say okay so it's an unusual store name really mm-hmm. the industry there's a lot of aqua whatever I, kind of all or spa it all runs together but yeah. st sears is one that has stuck out to me and so that's how I remember you guys as a D1 dealer, like when I started in the industry in 2008. Yeah, it's, you know, St. Cyr, just the family name. It's something that I think is really interesting. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you guys is I think, so something that we've talked a lot about in the magazine over the last couple of years, and I think the industry has been talking about in general is sort of what that next generation of hot tub retail looks like. And you're starting to see private equity groups come in. You're starting to see like the bigger, like Leslie's buyout, independent hot tub retailers. But the other trend that we're starting to see in that arena is you're starting to see kind of growth within independent retailers where people are buying each other and growing and growing. And so it's, which is really exciting. And I love to see the independent family businesses start to expand out and grow and get bigger. That is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you guys, because that it's just such an interesting thing we're seeing in our industry. Um, but what is it about you two that made you want to go out and acquire, at this point, two other businesses? Like the whole budget pools acquisition is funny because we joked about it when we first started. It's like, yeah, well, when we buy budget pools, you know, because there's such a big retailer, uh, uh, Goliath in our region. Really? And it's, Yeah. And it's just, I think the reason why you're seeing the trend is just timing, right? We're in the right place at the right time. There's just so many of these second, third generation companies and no succession there. What are they going to do? And especially in our region in the Northeast, it's seasonal. So it's really tough for private equity or investors to come into the space outside of the industry. And we just happen with both budget pools and now swimming pool center in Hampstead be in a position to take advantage of that you now when these things come up. And I think with our age and our energy that we have, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we take advantage of that opportunity? And I just think it's about vision, right? I think this hasn't happened before because I think it's just, you've got to have a big enough vision to say, okay, I can go out and do that. I can take that risk. And I think the two of us combined both have that in us. So it works really well. Sometimes I look at it, I'm like, are you crazy? But it works. So yeah. yeah and sometimes maybe we are biting off a little bit more than we can chew, but I think, I think in the long run, it's really going to work work out yeah and i think covid kind of kicked that off dude because you had a lot of business owners that were either getting tired and wanted to get out as soon as everything got crazy they were like get me out of here and then you have others that are i think as things start to normalize too you're going to start seeing a lot more people get out because people that were close and rode that way and wanted to take advantage of it now as things are getting down near the the end of that they're they're also it's it's time now they want to yeah. get out too and then you got the rest that have a good succession plan and we'll just continue the way that they're going yeah yeah so do you guys mind telling us how old you are i feel like we need to gauge that so i'm 38 okay yeah i'm 35 i've told everybody i'm 29 for the yeah. last six years but... but i feel like just keep going with it why not <laughs> and my kids it's funny it's like a joke they get me a happy 29th again for they card each year perfect <laughs> So, I mean, you talked about, you talked about the pandemic, Brandon, and I think that's a great point because you've gone through this time that was just, that was a lot. And so talking to people in the industry, you have seen people put off retirement in that time period because it was just so crazy and they felt like they couldn't leave kind of people high and dry. But yeah, Mm -hmm. now that things are starting to slow down, I wonder if you're starting to see those people who put off their retirement being like, okay, now's the time or people who are like, you know what? Things are going to slow down and I don't have it in me after the craziness of the last three years and the energy to power through what the next phase of this looks like. Yeah, I think you're right there because you know, I think COVID made it easy for us with all everybody and their brother wanted a pool or a spa. So yeah. it was like you know, the sales they, easy. I don't sure there was anything the else that yeah, was the, easy. The rest of it was, yeah, <laughs> they, they had this opportunity for a bit of a windfall and now it's, oh, now I have to go back to work and add it like like we had to in years past. So I think you're right. I think you'll see 
just more of it. And it's just, you know, the generation, you know, they talk, talk about this, not just in the pool industry, but it's a big thing in the trades, HVAC, plumbing, electrical. There's a lot of business owners in blue collar fields that, that just, there's no, nobody behind them. I think you're going to see it in, in a lot of industries going forward. I think on the service end too, it was COVID was we're able to use it as a scapegoat, even though we had supply issues and all these other issues that were real factors. If something was wrong everybody was understand right. just with everything that was going on to just say that times are tough yeah. right now and they would say okay yeah but <laughs> as long as, as we're getting out of it i think you're gonna have to be better and all your techs and, and staff are gonna have to be well educated and knowledgeable mm -hmm. and that we can't they're gonna command a higher customer experience and they should and you have to be able to deliver it. We have to cross our T's and dot our I's more now that we're getting out of that craziness. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's such a great point. Can't really, it's getting to the point where you're, you can't get away with things anymore. You can't blame COVID necessarily anymore. Even though there are some still COVID hangover things as, with supply chain and labor and all of that, people are probably not quite as understanding as they were back in 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got to raise the game a little bit. Yeah, which is good. And they shouldn't be. What's your vision going forward then now that you've got, you've got three businesses, are you planning on bringing them all under one umbrella? Are you going to kind of keep them separate? What's the <laughs> grand vision? Are you going to become the, I don't know, the Walmarts of <laughs> or big box store of hot tubs? That's like the daily discussion around here is we just go on under one entity or do this or that. And I think it's twofold with budget pools. They have been in that location with that name since 1965, right? Oh, You're yeah. such a they're like an institution in North of Boston here. So it'd be really tough to go in and change that name. And they're so close. They're in close proximity. So keeping those two separate and having different hot tub lines in each makes sense. But with New Hampshire, it's 45 minutes away. It's a totally different territory. And they do the same type of work that we do with as far as service, retail, hot tubs, pools, and all that. So it really makes sense to, to bring those two together under the same seer name. And I think as we grow and venture out, whether it's either opening new stores or more acquisitions, we're going to take more of a unified approach like that. Budget Pools was just a special case because of where it's been and its history and how right. close it is. That makes perfect sense. You see a lot of retailers do that, right? Where they'll have, if they open another location close by, sometimes they've got different brands, different branding, right. all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And they really just do what they can to capture that entire market. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it would be easier if we put it all under an yeah, umbrella yeah. in one name. But I know our vision, and I know Brandon, especially with all his crazy ideas, okay. we're going to try to make this a multi region endeavor, whether that's just New England or Massachusetts or whatnot. I don't see any signs of slowing down or stopping, which is why people think we're crazy. But, yeah. I think it goes first, too, is just oops, the start of the roadmap. It's, it's where we want to, or at least where we want to keep going with that, whether it is opening new stores or acquiring them. But I yeah. think that we'll keep that single brand approach going forward. Yeah. yeah. Budget was just a lot off. Yeah. Special case, like you said. Right? Yeah, that makes and sense. I, and I think, yeah, I mean, just operationally, we know we have to really bring our A game and get things where they need to be before we can grow much further. But doing some really cool stuff on that end to, to bring those things together so we can operate in multiple regions efficiently and effectively. So. Yeah. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to talk about that in a minute. Okay. But I, first, I'm curious. So you've mentioned this a couple of times about Brandon having the crazy ideas. So how mm -hmm. does your partnership work? Because when you talk to people about getting into business and starting your own business, they're like, oh, don't have a partner. It's awful. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. But so how do you guys manage that? Do you bring different skill sets to the table? Like, how do you work through the inevitable, you know, conflict and stress that comes up as trying to run a business as a team. I think it's good because you know, we don't get rattled very easily. I think Brandon more so than me. I thought I was pretty even cute, uh, but he just yeah, can't shake this guy. But I think when we first came together in 2019, it made a lot of sense because of his service background and his mechanical inclination and me more from the retail side and the sales and marketing. It just that naturally works. He likes getting out in the field and plumbing systems together or working on hot tubs. It's, yeah, I've done that. I could do that if needed to, but you don't want to hire me to, to plumb your pool system. It's not going to work very good. So I think those from a skill set, it complements really well. But I think just personality wise, just being really even keel and talking things out, we're always communicating. It's just communication is really what's all about, I think. Yeah. As our partnership, I'm more of the jump in without any sort of plan, which I told you I moved to Florida without 
any I had without no a place plan. to live <laughs> <laughs> with my bag on my shoulder. And Jay is very thoughtful and, and thinks out every step, uh, which is good. It's a good balance. And I think that's what the basis of this whole thing is that we do have a good balance between our skill sets. And like he said, he's very retail sales oriented and I'm mechanical service end, which I love. I was just, I was fixing a hot tub before I ran in the room to do this. So yeah. this, <laughs> I love getting in, but I think we have a good balance. I think that's yeah. what it really is. Yeah, that seems to be the basis, I think, of most successful partnerships that I've seen in the industry is you balance each other out. And then, yes, you have found a way to communicate effectively. It probably helps that your personalities, like you said, are, are not too, super fiery. Yeah, you, usually if one of us is getting up in arms and stuff about something, it's me and he's, you know, talking me off the ledge. So, you know, it works. Yeah. I like, too, that... Um, I, you know, that balance of jump in without a plan and then I'm going to maybe overthink everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's So it's good. You've got Brandon kind of push the envelope and maybe make you a little bit uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. then you've got Jay to rein things back in and say, okay, but how can we actually do this yeah, yeah, <laughs> and exactly. move forward in a way that makes sense? So yeah, that's, it's good to have, it's good to have both sides for sure. And then I think on top of that, you got to surround yourself with people around that can work in that environment because neither one of us are very organized or very action and growth driven. So having organized people around us to help also bring the two of us in is, is much needed. So yeah, I think the whole thing that we're trying to do here is a little uncomfortable yeah. acquiring new businesses or opening new businesses and you have to get out of your comfort zone to do that. Yeah. I mean, we went from when we acquired St. Cyr in 2019, they had two employees and now we're closing on 50 employees between all three locations. So having to adapt to that and learn to grow is it's definitely going to put you in some uncomfortable positions and, and we're learning every day when it comes to that. So. That's what entrepreneurship is all about, right? <laughs> you <Literally>. sometimes, <laughs> sometimes got to pull the trigger before you, uh, you know, you get the money before you have the sales sometimes. And it's pretty, oh, yeah. it'd be pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. From two employees to 50, that's a big leap. But like you mentioned earlier, Jay, that's a big leap just operationally, right? Mm -hmm. You suddenly need to have an employee handbook and need to have policies and need to have systems and like all these mm -hmm. things that when you're smaller, you can get away with. If you've got good people just being like, they handle this, they handle that. No one really mm -hmm. needs to know what's in everybody's brain. So how are you working through that? And then on top of that, you've got the three different businesses that have been running in three different ways. And now you've got to mesh them all together in some way. It's not easy. And no. you've done like 2019 to 2023. Like that's not that long to get that all figured out. It's a short window. Yeah. I, I think we really tried to get our back end situated in Middleton the last couple of years. What was, we were kind of spoiled by those groups. Um, that team over there has been together for 20 or 30 years all working together and yeah. they have their systems, they have it down pat. So that was really, um, it, it, it almost made us think, oh man, did we have a cheat code or something here? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Where on the St. Cyr side, it's you know, like I said, we only we started with two employees. So we had to bring people up and we had to do training and we had to really, like you said, a handbook. It's like, we never had a handbook. We never had policies. And when you have our employees, you keep asking these questions about PTO this and health insurance and all that stuff. So we had to go outside and hire consultants and people that knew about this stuff to take it over. So we did that and we invest a lot in technology and automation. We're completely paperless here in Middleton. We run one of the best trade service, service type CRMs out there that really helps bring everything together. And now we can take that and say, okay, this is almost like a prototype. Let's go put this over in Hampstead in New Hampshire. Yeah. So can work. I can I ask you, what are you using for your CRM? Is it a secret or can we know? We're using Service Titan. Which, okay, uh, got it. Yeah. 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 So that's more for the HVAC plumbing and electric. We were one of early adopters in the pool industry, but when you're running multiple trucks, it, it can just do almost everything but a retail POS, but it okay. helps us out a lot. It's funny. I think the issue that this story is going in, we actually have another story about that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and about what yeah. software are you using to help keep yeah. your service department organized? So that fits in. Yeah. That's So that's why I'm extra curious about that this okay. time around, because it, yeah. it's interesting to see... Um, where people find the solution that works for them. I've heard of Service Titan before, but it's not super common in our industry yeah. because it's not made for our industry. So it's interesting to see how people find things that they can make work for pools and hot tubs. Yeah, and I, I think it was just more of when I'm looking at these you know, things about whether it's technology, whether it's a marketing company to use, say, what are the best companies in the world using? 
right? And even if we weren't ready for it and we couldn't afford it, let's go for it because we're going to need it. We're going to grow into these things. And that was kind of the approach we took with that. So, yeah, I think that is a big approach that we're, we're trying to set things up there. Even if we're not ready yet, we are growing into it because we do want to keep growing. If we're not setting it up to grow into it, then we're constantly trying to catch up. And like you were saying, with opening the other locations and what sort of challenges is that? I think that we've been letting them run on their own for a little while to, to figure out how yeah. everything works. And if they're doing something that works over there that we're not doing, and then adapting the way they do it slowly to our method and our own way of doing things. We tell staff, hey, we're not coming here to turn everything upside down and pop the boat. Keep doing what you're doing because you've obviously, you guys have been in business for a long time. You're doing something right. So we'll just come in and, and add the things on top to make it better. But we're not going in there and just rocking the boat entirely. Well, that seems to be the wise approach for most acquisitions. You don't want to, you don't want to alienate the employees the first day by saying, <laughs> right. okay, we're going to do everything different than you've ever done it before. And it seems like you guys have a good idea too of trying to take what you can that works from each one and learn and figure mm -hmm. it out. Because yeah, when you come from a small family business, you're not doing things a certain way because you don't have to. And now that you're, you see how a bigger business operates and it's like, okay, these are the things that make sense for, like you said, our vision and where we want to go, where we want to go next. Absolutely. Yeah. And you have to be willing to be flexible and, and learn and not just do things because it's the way you've always done. Yeah. And we, we've had to learn quick. So seeing how other businesses are doing it, we don't know just because we're doing it a certain way. It's in a short amount of time. And they've, these companies have been operating for decades. So there's got to be something there that we can learn. I had this conversation the other day with a new hire. And I was like, just so you know, if something doesn't work, we don't, we're done with it and we move on. Don't get too used to things being the way they are because it, mm -hmm. I will change it if it's, if it sucks. <laughs> yeah. I'm done. Yeah. That's good that you tell your employees that up front. Cause sometimes we do that and they're like, Hey, is this how, this is how we did it yesterday. How uh, you change that? <laughs> it's like, no, we're going to, we're going to continue to yeah. grow and get better. And so be prepared because we will change things on a dime if we have to. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, and there I think go. everything's moving faster and faster too. Yeah. So our industry has been the way that it's been done is the way that it's always been done. And now it's more technology is getting into it. And these sort of things are happening, but it's going to move faster and right. things are going to change very quickly. Yeah, it is an exciting time, I feel like, for our industry because in addition to that generational switch that we're starting to see, kind of like the hot tub industry in particular is still really young. Guys who founded these manufacturers and founded these stores, they're still alive. Like we're still, still in that. Yeah, we're still in that first generation. Like those guys are now starting to retire and step away mm -hmm. and hand it off. And so we're a young industry and so much has changed in that time frame. And it is it's a very exciting time, like you said, for the generational switch, but then also for the technology and I feel like we have not even scratched the surface of some of the things that we could be doing in our industry to move the move the needle. Oh, absolutely. We're taking that approach from the service side, putting a lot of technology and things on the service side of the business that hasn't really been done in our area to try to elevate the customer experience. But just, yeah, on the manufacturer level, what they're doing with technology there, the new products and the new designs and how that's been evolving over the last few years. It's like hot tubs look the same for like, 30 years. And then all of a sudden the last five years, they're all getting on to this new. Yeah. There've been some really concept. cool new yeah. things that have come out. Absolutely. Yeah. And not just Absolutely. from technology, but even just in how they look, you're right. I mean, just it's, design. It's, yeah. yeah, it's a box of, it's a box of hot water. Yeah. Like, we get it, but yeah, they've been doing <laughs> some, they've been doing some cool things to push yeah. the envelope. It's been fun. Yes. Yeah. And I think we just got to take advantage of that, and get more awareness out there in the public and just keep pushing it. Yeah, and I think on our end, you keep, like you were saying about trying new things, you can't be afraid of trying new things, but you also can't be afraid of stopping those new things that you try if they're not working. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. We talked to a marketer a while ago and he's like, unfortunately, you don't know if something works until you try it. And if it doesn't mm -hmm. work, you don't do it again. If it works, you keep moving on. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you know that Strong Spas has hot tubs in stock and available now? The company has overstock and recertified hot tubs that are ready to ship. Strong also has the industry's shortest lead times on made to order tubs. Strong Spas can put hot tubs in your showroom now, filling any holes where there should be floor models or holes in your product offering. You can still diversify your suppliers by adding Strong to your product mix. Strong Spas has expanded its production capacity and as always is made in the USA. To become an authorized dealer today, visit strongspas.com slash dealer. So I'm curious, though, since you do swimming pools, you do hot tubs, you've got retail and service, 
and construction. How does that hierarchy look in your business? Are you, is there kind of one department that's sort of like your, your big one? How does that breakdown look for you guys? It's changed a lot. I would say when we first started, it was kind of 50, 50, as far as hot tubs and service and retail. And as we grew, um, I think what we were doing on the service side, when we added service tight and then we just started elevating that customer experience and a lot, like Brandon was saying, a lot of people got out during COVID, the service department just skyrocketed and we were able to grow that exponentially every single year, a lot faster. So now service, I would say Middleton is the majority there. But once we acquired budget pools, it was just retail is now the big chunk. Um, New Hampshire will balance that out a little bit, but I would still say it's probably 60% service and renovation and, and that, and then the rest retail and hot tubs. So, yeah. yeah. It's been, that's been a learning experience too, as we're going along and growing, we're trying to figure the structure out on the fly, mm -hmm. especially, like I said, I will jump in without a plan. So. We're acquiring these businesses and not having a structure set up. And now that we're trying to be in multiple places at once, that structure is even more important. But I think services, there's so many moving parts to it that it took a lot of our attention and that attention caused growth in that area. So service really took off and we're now trying to go back to retail and hot tubs and stuff yeah. because it's not order taking anymore. We have to sell again. Right. So Yeah, <laughs> right. I think so that probably had a little bit to do with the times, yeah. right? Like you yeah. could let the sales part just run on its own for a while exactly. there because you, you were going to be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so Absolutely. that kind of makes sense that you would, yeah, you put your concentration and put your energy into what you could actually, where you could actually make a meaningful change. Exactly. And that's exactly what happened, just like you said. So, you know, yeah. now we're making that adjustment. That's kind of our big push is to get back to our roots. And, and kind of like you were talking about with how does a partnership work? In the beginning, we had this very black and white split on how we were going to do things. And everything got crazy in COVID. It got very blended. And, yeah. uh, and so now we're like he said, this winter, really trying to get back to that sort of black and white split again so that we can each focus on different things. Yeah, on different things and focus on the things that like you individually enjoy and right. you you personally feel like as your your better skill set. Exactly. Absolutely. The things that we can excel at. Yeah. So I love that you talk about service as being one of your your big money makers or revenue drivers for your business because I just I think that's not there's a lot of companies where they don't they see service as a necessary evil and they don't focus on trying to make it a profit center and so it's just like something that they have to do they got to do the warranty work because you know that's they have to and they got to take care of their customers because they have to and yeah. it's like I think we saw it in the recession some and I think we're going to start seeing it now where our attention is going to start to turn to service and like you said renovations and those kind of things because i think that's going to be where some real money can be made over the next few years yeah and it's too much of a pain in the butt to not make money at it and i think we took a different approach at it too as far as the necessary evil a lot of the phone calls we were getting were not for our hot tubs yep so we started diving into you know kind of that how can we make money at this because just doing our warranty work you half the time there's people standing around and there's a lot of people out there that aren't getting service. Right. And so we started accepting other brands, which is unusual. Right. And and also we started looking at other companies that, that where they're thinking it's a necessary evil. How can we work with you? If you just want to sell hot tubs, that's great. How can we take on your service and do that sort of warranty work and things for you that will allow you to excel at what you're doing, which is like moving units right. and selling hot tubs? That's yeah. a, that's fascinating. But it's really smart because, yeah, there are people who just like that's not what they want to do. Um, mm -hmm. at all. And so, and that, that's fine. As long as they oh, can yeah. give that customer experience, like you said, and keep those people happy mm -hmm. and taken care of and isn't giving a black eye to our, our whole industry because you've got these orphan tubs out there with no retailer or manufacturer mm -hmm. to care for them anymore. And the other thing being where we're in the Northeast where it's so seasonal, right? What are we going to do with these guys? If we have to lay them off in the winter, how are we going to get them right. back in the spring once school season starts going, right? If hot tub service is year round. So as if we just relied on the tubs we sold, that would be tough to do. But bringing in all brands, becoming warranty centers for other manufacturers that don't have a dealer in the area, that has allowed us to keep these guys on full time and allow us to grow that department. So we have multiple trucks running when we need them and training wise. It's much easier yeah. to train people when they're here year round versus six months out of the year. Yeah, absolutely. I think being able to service the tubs, even that we didn't sell. Um, it, it helps the industry out because a lot of the people that are, aren't being able to get service, they kind of feel like they're left out to dry and it gives them a bad taste in their mouth from, from the whole experience. Occasionally we'll get consumers who will call us up and be like, Hey, what's the best hot tub brand? 
Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I think you should look around and say, who's the best retailer in my local area? That's where I always steer them because like even the best hot tub manufacturer can have a lemon. Like you cannot mm -hmm. guarantee that this product's going to be perfect and work perfect all the time. But if something does go wrong, you want someone who's going to be in your corner and be there for the long haul so that get those problems fixed so that you're not, yeah, trying to put in a new control panel by yourself. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's no fun for anybody. <laughs> if something's going to break, yeah. but it's what happens then that yeah. is what makes the whole experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. So here you are, the three acquisitions in, not not slowing down. Like I, it's pretty clear. Like you will be buying other companies at some point. Hopefully mm -hmm. not tomorrow, because then this podcast will look silly. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, I guess what? Where are you hoping that this business is at in the next, like, ten years? Ooh, 10 years. Wow. I know. Ooh, I was I was going to go, go three, five, and then I was years. like, mm, let's really push the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Like I said, I just jump in it without a plan. So I really don't have a plan looking mm -hmm. forward. But but I'm as far as these acquisitions went, I'm, I'm always looking. I'm always shopping. And I'm always looking even for organic growth, where we can open new stores. And so as far as 10 years, I've always set my sights on New England. So I didn't really shoot out of there. <laughs> so we've done, if we keep up our pace, that's, yeah. that's what another eight, nine, 10 locations. Yeah. That's a really tough pace to, <laughs> to continue, but you got to shoot high. So. You got to aim high. You yeah. got to aim high. I think it's not even as much about how many stores are we going to have or, or what's our revenue going to look like. Mm -hmm. so I always focus, I focus a lot on reviews and customer experience. And I want to be the highest review, best um, company in New England, whether that's for pools or, or spas. So we really put an emphasis on that. Mm -hmm. So if we can make the same seer name, the most recognized and most trusted name in New England when it comes to pools and spas, that would be my goal. I know that's cliche, but that's how you're going to get to where you have multiple stores. You have eight, nine, 10, you can bring in good talent to help you run these stores, which is exactly. very cool, yeah. is to have that type of vision. And the other thing is, I heard this quote once, is if you're going to bring in talent to help you grow at that pace, you have to have a big enough vision to fit everybody else's dreams and vision into, right? Yeah. So that's really important for us. So that's why we have to aim high. We can't take our foot off the gas because we have a lot of people that are now coming along for the ride with us. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of this growth doesn't mean anything if you're not delivering the best experience that you can. That top-notch customer experience is the most important thing. Yeah. And it's interesting talking to people who have both bought and sold businesses. It's all about just being open to opportunity. You're never really prepared for your next acquisition. You're never really prepared to sell your business. It's never the quote unquote right time, but the right time is when the offer is made, right? And so you just have to be open to accepting that and going for it when it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's not like when in 2019, we got together, we wrote a business plan. So yeah, we're going to acquire three companies in the next four years. It's just, mm -hmm. like I said earlier in the podcast, it's, we were the timing where we were and where those companies were, Yeah, it, we just met and it just happened. And like you said, you have to be ready to take advantage of those opportunities because they're not going to come around very often. We right. might not get the opportunity to acquire another business for four or five, six years. Might not be out there. Might not be. Fast, Which would so. be normal, by the way. Just Correct. FYI, yeah. I think <laughs> that would be a normal pace. But yeah, you don't. The time is never right. I think, and right. you have to be an opportunist. How did these? two opportunities come along then for you guys? Were they, were you looking? Did you reach out to an owner who was like, oh yeah, that actually does make sense. Or did you know they were for sale? How did that kind of happen? With Budget Pool, like I said, we have talking about it, half joking for a couple of years there. Just through my connections locally in the industry, I knew people who knew the owners and was just getting, hearing that they wanted to sell or trying to sell, wanted to get out. And why don't we just have a conversation? We just called them up and had a meeting and Took it from there. Swimming pool center was a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, that was a little different. He was looking to get out, and uh, and so that's how we came across that one. But I think too, as we start to to do these sort of things, these acquisitions, that we're going to gain more traction, and because a lot of the people that are on the fence now have an outlet. Yes. Now yes. I didn't know it was an opportunity. They, they, I didn't know it was there before. But a lot of it too, I think, is no matter how big the industry is and our market is, it's very small, and it's tight knit, and so you really kind of know what everybody else is doing it or what they're looking to do. Yeah, that's yeah, true. The, the swimming pool center deal was on the market. It was a broker deal, unlike budget pools, which was just sure. kind of, we knew people who knew people. 
So. Yeah. You've seen it from a little bit of both sides then. Our industry is small. Like the rumor mill is crazy. The things I hear on a weekly basis are just kind of <laughs> insane yeah. times. Once work gets out that you're sort of in that mode, yeah, I think people probably start coming out of the coming out of the woodwork. Like they did with the with private equity and Leslie's and all that. It was like, oh, yeah. you mean I don't have to like work here till I die? And I think that transition too is a little daunting. All right. How do I do it? Yes. And having somebody like us that you can guide you through that path, I think really helps. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fun to see this happening. And yeah, I'm really excited for you guys and where you're going. Congratulations on three acquisitions. We'll count State Sears in there as well. So yeah, that's, it's really great. And it's really fun to see in our industry. Right. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. We're excited about it. Are you guys ready for the Spari Tiller 5? Sure. All right. They're not too, not too hard, but so do you <laughs> remember... You're the first hot tub you ever sold. Do you remember any of the details of that? I do. Um, we had just closed the other location in Salisbury. So I was sent down here to Middleton and I was just left alone in the store. I don't know why. And I a couple came in and I sold them a D1 diplomat. I remember it very distinctly. Oh, all right. I diplomat. I sold it for $11,800. I remember that. Yeah. Exactly. Because I went out back and my brother's like, you sold this for what? And I was like, that's what the thing on the, the, the price sheet said. Were you high or low, according to him? <laughs> I was I was high, apparently. It was like, Perfect. yeah. So, Even better. So it was good. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think I sold another hot tub for a while after that because everybody realized not to leave me on the floor alone. But <laughs> That's, but, so yeah. fun. that's how that yeah. happens a lot of times too honestly oh, yeah. is that yeah. those first sales i feel are often an accident <laughs> yes it very much was an accident mm -hmm. yeah. so it's kind of funny with me i've never personally sold a hot tub uh yeah. I'm, I'm not good at it. it is the short skinny of it I, i'm more on the technical side and nobody wants to hear the technical side of the hot tub they want to hear about yeah. what it's going to be and so yeah. whenever i come across an opportunity where we would be selling a hot tub i pass it off to those that can do it yeah that's wise <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Jay, was St. Sears your first like real W2 paying job then when you were a kid? Almost. I started at St. Sears when I was 16, right when I got my license. Once I could drive to the store. But before right. that, when I was riding my bike everywhere, I was working at a greenhouse, you know, okay. and Snapdragons or something like that. <laughs> for, all right. All right. <laughs> but other than that, this has really been my only job. Yeah. I had the same job for 22 years. How about you, Brandon? I've had a few jobs. My first one was washing dishes. Very hot, very little money, but a very good company. And from there, I think I went into moving furniture in high school. Oh, man. And did that for maybe a decade or so. Yeah. I think my husband delivered furniture for maybe two weeks. And then he was like, yeah. oh, get this. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. It was tough, but I enjoyed it. You haven't been in business for too long, but looking back, can you think of kind of the worst maybe idea that you've brought to the business, something that you were really excited about, and then it just did not go as planned. So would that be saunas or patio furniture? What Ooh, do you think? those are two, those are two good ones. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like you was like we were talking about with you got to keep bringing ideas to the table. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and you got to keep innovating and trying new things or you're just not going to excel. So we, yeah, we've tried new products and did not work. Uh, the people that we sold it to are us. Yeah. They're in our backyards, so those sort of things. Uh, we've tried things on the service end, different processes. I came up with some convoluted idea of how we we're going to do warranties of budget yeah, that just didn't work. Different. And then the second iteration didn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for flopping. He doesn't hold it against me that those two decisions, saunas and patio furniture, were my idea. So that's good. Yeah. But Not I mean, that's, that's the thing. Patio furniture is tough. Like, that's, yeah. a, that's a hard category. Um, yeah. But like, you know, you see lots of hot tub retailers who also sell saunas. And so, but, you yeah. know, I feel like you never, until you try it in your, in your market. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Don't know until you try. Yeah. But it didn't work. So we cut it loose. Just yeah. kind of what you were saying. So you yeah. just have a sauna, a sauna lineup in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've got a nice section over the fire pit. Yeah. Perfect. So then what about the best idea that you feel like you've done so far that you've brought to the business? Something that went better than you thought? I would say when we opened the doors to servicing all makes and models hot tubs, 
So before we came along, we were just working on the tubs we sold. And I told Brandon all the reasons why, because it's a lot of different parts and things like that. But uh, once we did, it just, it allowed us to do those things, keeping the techs on, growing our technician base year round and made the shoulder seasons a bit easier, the winter seasons mm -hmm. a bit easier. I think that what is really what put us on a growth trajectory was just opening up the services that we provide on that end. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. And just having a good vision, but also being able just to listen, I think bringing that to the table where it's not just our ideas, but it's, it's everybody that works for us. They all have awesome ideas and just trying them out. Yeah. Yeah. And there might be a diamond in the rough there that we're just not seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Last question then is kind of where do you get either inspiration or relaxation? So do you have a favorite <laughs> book or television show or podcast? What do you turn to when you either are looking for some ideas or need a break? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's tough. Need a break. I don't really like that. Yeah, I think both of us have a really hard time turning it off. I think my wife would say the same thing. It's turned off business mode. I'm a big podcast guy in the truck. I listen to a lot of podcasts yeah. from all different industries and things like that. Audio books. Probably the best thing is listening to a book like The Edith by Michael Gerber. I know that's like super cliche. But I know, just... but it's still, it's a great book. It's cliche it, for it a is. reason. It's a yeah. good one. <laughs> I listen to that audiobook too. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. It's just, yeah, I have a hard time shut, shutting it off, but I'm always learning. I'm just, I just love learning, just growing and learning. And learning. So that's yeah. my outlet. Yeah. I think that's kind of what an entrepreneur is anyway. It's always on your mind. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like I have a motor in me that just doesn't shut off. So I, it's tough to sit still. So when I do get home, it's not really taking a break and relaxing. It's yeah. I like hiking and things like that. Yeah. And it helps to take a break from it because I don't have mm -hmm. cell phone signal and stuff. So you have to just, you know, you're in yeah. your own head then. You're out of pocket. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, and I don't have any choice. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's funny because I feel like I've got one or the other on the podcast. Like I've, I've got people like you, Jay, who are like just constantly got to have the kind of that be listening, learning, figuring stuff out. And then I've, then there's people like you, Brandon, who are like, no, I go for a run or I work on my car. There was a guy a couple episodes ago. That was how he would unwind, was working on his cars. And it's like you find it where you can and whatever fits your mode. <laughs> And I think that kind of brings us back to that balance. Thank you guys so much for coming on. It's been really fun. It's been fun to learn your story. I feel like I could think of a lot of other questions that I haven't brought up yet. But yeah, this was great. Congratulations. And I'm really excited to see what's up next for you guys. Well, thank you very much. We yeah. appreciate you having us on. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Spa Retailer Podcast is a production of Spa Retailer Magazine. Let us know what you think by leaving a review or emailing us at podcast at spa Thanks for listening.